So, welcome to this uh, last lecture in uh, the course log 500. Um, and today I will present the solution for the exam from last year in the course log 502, which is uh, more or less the, uh, the same curriculum. Um, and of course, you are aware of the exam, which is the Monday, the 1st of December, which is in five days, so not uh, too far away. Um, I will uh, be available for questions at least uh, tomorrow and most of Friday. I might take uh, uh, well, an early uh, weekend on, on Friday, but I will also be, be back on, on Sunday afternoon probably. So if you have any questions, it's possible to, to send me an email and I can try, try to, uh, to answer them. Uh, the exam will be on the same, uh, yeah, same procedure as last year. Uh, here uh, we will have five hours of examination time from nine to until two o'clock. And uh, you are allowed to take all the written and printed aids in addition to, uh, to the calculator. So you can bring the textbook, you can bring your uh, personal notes uh, and also uh, solutions for, for earlier exams and, uh, um, earlier exams and uh, assignments, of course. Um, there will be well, language will be one Norwegian, uh, actually two, two Norwegian, the Bokmål and Nynorsk version, and also an English version of, of the exam. And the exam will cover 80%, which means that uh, the remaining part uh, is 10% each on the uh, two uh, assignments, you, uh, assignment number two and three, which you have already got, some, uh, uh, got your uh, grades on. Uh, quite important to know, uh, some general advice here, read through the complete problem text before you start to answer. It's very important to, uh, to know that you understand what you actually are going to, uh, to answer, uh, not just start uh, writing something and then if you, when you continue reading you find out you might have answered something else. Very important to, be, to answer directly and uh, answer all parts of the question. There might be several parts in, in the, in the sub-problems and, uh, and you need to answer all of them to get the full credit. Uh, there will probably be 20 sub-problems and all will count equally for the final grade of, of the exam and uh, some problems are quite small, uh, easy to, to answer. Others might uh, require a lot of, uh, of computations. So it's very important to manage the time on the exam. And uh, as uh, mentioned here, it's better to answer many problems partial than only a few perfect. So try if you get, uh, well, if you are lacking time, you should uh, try to uh, um, try to well, schedule, show the formulas at least, try to start uh, answering and, uh, and then you will get some credit if this is, is correct, even if you're not able to, to answer the problems perfectly. And rough sheets will not be graded and so they, there's no need to, uh, to hand them in with your paper because uh, we are not allowed to, to grade or, or consider the, the rough sheets when we are grading. Uh, yeah. Also, since all uh, written and printed aids uh, is allowed, it's very important that you organize your notes because there will, for most of you, will be uh, well, uh, lack of time on the exam. It's hard to get time to answer all problems perfectly. Uh, and you should organize your notes so you know exactly where you can find what you're looking for. So when you read the, the, the problem, you should uh, uh, you should know where the formulas are given, uh, where you can find maybe similar problems and so on, so you can, can look up that. Uh, there will not be no enough time to read through and, and look for something which you don't know exactly uh, where is. Uh, yeah, also on the exam day I will come to the exam room to clarify problems, uh, but I will not answer questions, of course. I will not tell you whether this is correct or wrong, and I will not give you hints of how to solve it. But if there are some, uh, something in the problem text which is unclear, I can be able to, uh, to clarify this. And uh, so you, at least, you, you better know what you should try to, uh, to answer. Uh, okay, let's uh, now have a look at last year's uh, exam. And first, we have a forecasting problem here. Uh, for the first question is actually a theoretical question. You should answer 
uh, or you should explain about the difference between the single, double and triple exponential smoothing and in which situation these uh, techniques are used. Uh, and then on uh, problem B, you're given a, uh, one uh, specific problem about an ice cream producer uh, has seen the following demand in the four quarters of the two previous years and you are given a table here with the demand in the first, second, third and fourth quarter. And you can see that this is typically a seasonal uh, problem which, uh, which has uh, seasonal differences in the demand. Ice cream sold mostly on the summer months, uh, not so much in the, in the winter. Uh, and here you are also given the normalization factor uh, which says that in the first, uh, ba based on, on this uh, sales here, uh, you, can, um, uh, you can conclude that in the first quarter you will have 59.44% of a normal sales. Um, in period number two you will have 118.79% of a normal sales and so on. So you can see the normalization factors here, which should be used in, in the models. You don't have to calculate them uh, yourself. Uh, you are given information that you should use winter's forecasting method. Uh, not always. Uh, well, in this case, you are, you are given the, the specific method. Sometimes you need to find out yourself which method to use. Uh, it could be winter's forecasting method, which is uh, uh, a typical triple exponential smoothing. There could be Holtz method where, where you have uh, uh, double exponential smoothing. Uh, you have also, if you go one or two years back, you had a problem which actually had no trends. So then you had seasonal differences with no, no trends and uh, it uh, would best be, uh, be solved by using the so-called uh, uh, simple method which is also explained in the textbook. Uh, so here at least you should use Winter's forecasting metho method, find the values for the gradient and the series based on the demand in this table here. Then use these values to make a forecast for each of the quarters in 2014. And the producer uses a, sm a smoothing constants shown here, alpha, beta and gamma. You have three smoothing constants where you have this triple exponential smoothing, the Winter's forecasting method and all of them have a value of 0 0.15. And after the first quarter, the demand is registered to be 70,555. So you should update the forecast for the second quarter with this information. Uh, and the last sub problem here, in the second quarter, you are given the demand as shown here, 115,180. So you should now compare the mean absolute deviation, the MAD uh, uh, measure, uh, for the, the first two quarters in 2014 on the forecast found in C, where you make the forecast based on the basic model, and in D, where you actually are updating the model based on the demand in, uh, uh, in, in the first quarter here. Uh, and then find the uh, the measure, the MAD, uh, mean absolute deviation, and answer which forecast has the lowest deviation, and you should also try to explain why this gives is the best result. So let's now try to, to look at uh, this, uh, the answer on, on this problem, and we can first take a look at the theoretical problem on the solution file, which is now uploaded in Fronter this morning. So you can find this, uh, this file about uh, the solution for, for this exam uh, in, in Fronter. Um, and here I'll try to give a very short explanation uh, on such theoretical question. It is uh, uh, important that you, uh, uh, that, that you answer, uh, well, uh, short, you don't have to write very much, but you should try to answer as directly as possible each of the questions. So to prove that you actually understand this, uh, this topic. And here the single exponential smoothing is the forecast based on observed demand and the latest forecast. So here we have the smoothing constant alpha, which decides the relative importance of each factor. And it's used in situations where there is no trend and no seasonal differences. So here, 
we will have a situation looking more like this. We have historical demand, which can look like this. And you should try to find the trend line like this. And when you get, uh, uh, not the trend line, of course, because here you don't have a trend, you should try to find a horizontal line, which best describes the demand here. And when, if this is the current date, when you get a new measure, some new data, it might be higher or lower, you only have to update the value or the, the value of the, the horizontal line here. So a higher demand will mean that you should update, uh, upgrade this a bit higher, a lower demand, you should give it a bit lower value. So this is in the single exponential smoothing. You only have one single line, which is the um, uh, which is uh, should be used to make the forecast, and then you look at the current value of the series. But in double exponential smoothing, use the same principles as with the single exponential smoothing, but now also introduce the possibility of forecasting trend. So here, you might have a situation looking like this looking at the historical data. And here you can see that it is possible to find a trend line in the data material. And now we have actually two things. One is to uh, forecast the value of the series, which could be used for, um, well, uh, which best fits to the historical data and should be used for forecasting into the future, but you also have to find the value of the gradient, how much this trend line will increase from one period to the next. And then forecasting will be to continue this line with the same gradient. And when you get new data, you can compare to where this line would be in the uh, coming uh, uh, periods. So if the new data is higher, you should try to update or upgrade the trend line and also the series. Uh, and if it's lower, you should uh, um, well update and, and find a lower value on both the gradient and also the corresponding value of the, the series. So, uh, double exponential smoothing, where Holtz method is one example. This is a method wh which is used when we can expect a linear trend in the sales. And then the triple exponential smoothing is also similar to double exponential smoothing uh, in the case that you have both a trend and uh, you, you should find the value of the series and also the value of the gradient of the trend. But now, in addition, you have seasonal factors. So you will have a trend line looking like this, but now you might have a situation looking like this, where you have four quarters, and uh, quarter three and four might have a high demand, and quarter one and two a low demand. So here, if this is year number one and this is year number two, you can see that you have a trend. The trend line would be more or less like this. But in addition, you have seasonal differences around the trend line. So here, by the triple exponential smoothing, where Winter's method is uh, an example, this is similar to double exponential smoothing, but you also have seasonal factors. So find the value of the series, which is the end point at the current time, end point at the trend line. Find the gradient, how much uh, the trend is uh, expected to increase or decrease from one period to the next, but also find the seasonal factors uh, for each season in or each period in the full year. So let's now look at problem B. And here we, ha we are given, we saw just saw the uh, the problem text from the, the exam. So we had the values here, we had the seasonal factors. 
And when using Winter's forecasting method, we should find the values for the gradient and the series based on the demand in 2012 and 13. Here we have four periods. And first, we should find the average in each of the two years. This is the average, the V1 will be the average of 2012, and V2 will be the average of 2013. So you can see that these numbers are the same as shown here. Then we have the V1 value, approximately here, and the V2 value approximately here. The midpoint of the line in each of, of the two uh, seasons or the, the two years. And when you know the V1 and the V2 value, it's very easy to find the trend line, which is the difference between these two values divided by the number of seasons or the number of periods. So here we can see that v2 minus v1 divided by 4, we will expect uh, or we will find the gradient which corresponds to an increase of 1419 from one period to the next period. Uh, and then we can find the value of the series, the S0, as v2, this point and add the gradient multiplied by n minus 1 divided by 2. So continue this line until we reach the line for the current time, where we actually are now, which is the, uh, the uh, new year on uh, between 2013 and 14. And we'll find that the G0 value is 1419, uh, and the S0 value is 89,840, which is this point. And we know that we have seasonal differences, so to find the exact forecast, we need to adjust by the seasonal factors which was given in the problem text. So now, use these values to make a forecast for each of the quarters in 2014. Well, we know we are here. To make a forecast, we should continue the trend line with the G value phone as 1419. So the trend will are expected to increase by 1419 for each period. And to make a forecast, we will use the formula as shown here which takes, uh, starts at the, the S0, this point. First, make a forecast for the first quarter. We will increase by the gradient one time and multiply by the seasonal factor shown here. Start here, increase by the gradient, but since this is a uh, low season, we will find this point, but we have to multiply this point by 59%, and we will get something around here. And similar for the second period, then we still have to start at S0, the current value of the series, but now we should increase by two times the gradient, two multiplied by 1419. And again, multiply by C2, and C2 in this case, now we are into the second quarter, which is a high season, 1.18. So that means that we are actually above here somewhere. We are now above the trend line because this is a high season. And for the third quarter, uh, again, continue from S0, add three times the gradient multiplied by the seasonal factor for the third quarter which means that now we will be around here. And the fourth quarter, the S0 plus four times the gradient and multiplied by C4, which is a low season, which means that you will end up somewhere here under the trend line. So this is now 
that uh, how we are using the Winters method, the triple exponential smoothing method, when we are forecasting for one full year, uh, in uh, and starting from from the, uh, the the first of January the, that particular year. So we have to multiply by this tau value, which is the number of periods in advance we have to make the forecast. But then on problem D, we are asked about the, well, the producer will use the th smoothing constants, which has the value of 0 0.15. And after the first quarter, the demand is registered to be 70,555. We remember that the first quarter, we had a forecast of 54,000. This means that uh, even if the S0 was 89,000 here, uh, we had a forecast here, but the actual demand was much, was much higher, 70,555. So the actual demand is now up here. And this means we have to adjust the value of the series and the value of the gradient because this seems to indicate that the trend is increasing. The sales will probably be higher because we had a much higher uh, sales in the first quarter than we actually had forecasted. So now we will update first the series by using this formula. Alpha is now the importance of the last measured demand which is 0 0.15. So 0 0.15 has to be multiplied by the D for the current period, now the new demand, which is 70,555, uh, divided by the seasonal factor, which we used, 59.44, uh, plus one minus alpha, which then is 0 0.85, which now will represent the importance of the last forecast. And the last forecast is found by the series value plus the gradient value. So now we can see that the value of the ST, or now will be the S1, the series value for the first quarter is 95,374. Which means that we should probably find the series value up here because we have a higher increase than we expected. Uh, and then we also need to adjust the gradient. And the gradient will be the beta smoothing constant, which is the difference between the current and the previous S value, the difference between this and this S value, multiplied by 15%. And 1 minus beta, 85%, multiplied by the previous value of the gradient. And now we will see that the gradient is increasing up to 2036. So the gradient, the expected uh, increase from one period to the next, will now increase based on the uh, higher demand in the first quarter than uh, well compared to what we had forecasted. And here also, uh, it's not asked for this in the, in the question, but ideally you should also update the, uh, uh, the seasonal factor because this can also uh, be changed. There could be changing, uh, changes uh, in the seasonal factors from one season to, to the others. That might happen for, for some products. But here we are not asked about that and this is not well, should not be done before a full season, a full year is, is uh, finished. But we have also formulas with the gamma smoothing constant, where you should uh, update the value of the, uh, of the seasonal factor. Uh, and then, now we have a new value of the series, we have a new value of the gradient, and to find the forecast for the second quarter, we have to add the series values to the gradient value, and now we are only forecasting one period ahead, and we should adjust by the seasonal factor. So S1 
1 plus G1 multiplied by the seasonal factor will give a new forecast of 115,713. And then, next question, problem E. In the second quarter, you have a demand of 115,180, which is not very far from the forecasted value here. So we should now compare the mean absolute deviation for the two first quarters on the forecast found in problem C and D, and which forecast has the lowest deviation, and can you explain why this is, gives the best result? Well, the forecast for the first period was the same, um, 54,000 was the, was the forecast, but the actual value was 70,555. Uh, so the deviation in the two methods in first quarter will be the same, but the deviation in the second quarter is quite different because here we had first a forecast when we forecasted from period S0 in until period number two, we had a forecast of uh, uh, 110,000. But now, uh, after we had updated the uh, series and the gradient in period number one, we had only a deviation of 538. Difference between this measured value and the forecasted value. So then we can clearly see that the MAD is much smaller. The average of the deviation is much smaller in forecast from D, which uh, can be explained by here you have an increasing trend in the demand, and the trend is identified in, uh, uh, in quarter number one, in, and it's continuing until quarter number two. So by updating this model, we are able to identify this trend, but of course when you are forecasting for the full year in advance, you are not able to, uh, you don't, do not know about this, this coming trend. So this is the, the reason why the forecast from period D is better than forecast from, period, uh, from problem C. Okay, that's the first problem about forecasting. Let's now have a look at the second problem which is uh, a scheduling problem, uh, scheduling, last part of the curriculum. So you have not had any scheduling problems in your assignments, but there should be enough uh, other uh, problems, both uh, shown in the, uh, in the lectures and also in, uh, in exam, uh, the solutions for exam. So you should be able to, uh, to answer these types of, of problems too. And here we are asked about six patients waiting to get into a casualty clinic. Uh, you have only one doctor on duty. None of the injuries are life-threatening, but to avoid complications, it's recommended that they are treated within a given time after the occurrence. And looking at the injuries and the estimated time, the secretary had made the following table. So we have six patients. You have a given time of treating these injuries, and you are also given a time limit when they should be uh, finished uh, by treating. So first, a theoretical question here, what uh, objective do you think is the most important in this situation, and what priority method can be used to minimize that objective? Give reasons for the choice of objective. Uh, then use this method and make a priority sequence for the six patients. And on C, compare the sequence from B with a sequence based on the first come, first served strategy. Sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Use the relevant criteria for comparison, which is the mean flow time, the average tardiness, the minimum tardiness, and the number of tardy jobs. These four criteria are the common criteria for comparing different strategies. And then the last sub-problem here. Uh, the injury for patient number two is assumed to be the most critical and should have priority before the others. So simultaneously, the injuries for 
patient one and six are, sh are assumed to be moderate, where a delay will have small consequences for the patients. So for then drive, uh, draw a precedence diagram and find a new sequence which considers the priorities. So here you need to, uh, to consider the, uh, the priorities and use preferably Lawler's uh, method where you have some jobs which have priority before the others. Okay, let's now go back to the first problem and try to solve that. Um, and answer what priority is uh, considered to be the most important. And here there is, there is no uh, correct answer or wrong answer. There are arguments for different strategies. Uh, I think most uh, would actually uh, mean that uh, while none of these uh, injuries are uh, life-threatening as uh, it's stated here and you, you are not given information until problem D about priority. So here we can assume that maybe a small delay is possible for most of the patients, but a longer delay might lead to complications. Uh, so uh, I would uh, think that maybe the earliest due date strategy is the most convenient here. You might have a few minutes delayed on all the patients, which doesn't matter uh, very much. Uh, and then we can say that the objective about minimizing the maximum delay or the maximum tardiness might be the most relevant here. But there could be reasons or arguments for other strategies. And if you here, uh, answering su such question, give reason for the choice. If you are arguing for your choice, of course, it will be equally uh, correct. Uh, but if we now assume that we should use the earliest due date strategy, which is the strategy that should minimize the maximum tardiness, will meet that particular objective, then make a priority sequence for the six patients. Well, earliest due date means that we should look at the time limit and sort according to the time limit. So this one is the job which has to be, uh, be performed first, uh, should be performed within 30 minutes. And then 40 minutes is the next one, 45 minutes, 90, 110, and 120. So using the earliest due date strategy here means that we should sort after the time limit for the six different jobs. And then we have a priority sequence and we should compare this sequence with a sequence based on first come first serve, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, and use the relevant criteria as shown here for comparison. Well, if we look at the solution file, we'll just show the solution here, I don't need to use the blackboard, uh, but uh, we saw the priority sequence using the earliest due date, 352641. Each of them has a processing time as shown here, and finding the flow time or the completion time, then we should start from time zero and find out when each of these jobs are finished. So job two, no, job five will here be finished. It will be started after job number three, which takes 15 minutes and itself it takes 20. That means it, after 35 minutes, this job is finished. And then job number two needs 40 more minutes. And this column will tell you when each of these six jobs are finished. And this will make a total of 475. And to find the mean flow time, we have to divide by six, which is the number of jobs. So here you have a mean flow time of 79.2. We have an average tardiness. We can see that the due time is shown here and the tardiness, which is the delay for each of the jobs, are shown here. A total of 60, then the average tardiness would be 10. You have four tardy or four jobs, which is delayed, and the maximum tardiness is given as 30. And when we now compare to the 
first come, first served strategy. We can see here that the completion time is shown here, total of 450. Tardiness shown here, a total of 150. And the similar measures are 79, no, 75 on the first come, first served, 25 on the average tardiness, 4 on the number of tardy jobs, and the maximum tardiness of 60. So here we can see that the flow time will be slightly less by using the first come, first serve strategy. Uh, but the average tardiness will be much higher, and in particular the maximum tardiness will be higher than by using the earliest due date strategy. And since this was the, uh, the priority or the objective we have chosen, uh, we will have the earliest due date strategy, which will minimize the maximum tardiness, minimize the maximum delay of one job. So here we have two different strategies, and we are comparing the different measures uh, for these strategies. And in such uh, scheduling problems, uh, there are different objectives which might be conflicting, which means that the, the, uh, we have to choose what is the most important objective for, for us, and then use the strategy which will optimize that particular objective. If we have chosen an objective of uh, trying to get the lowest value of the mean flow time, we should, for example, rather use the, uh, the strategy of, uh, uh, of the shortest processing time. If the number of tardy jobs was the most important, it means that we have to well, realize that uh, to, uh, well, at least a few of the patients will have complications, and we should try to treat the others first then we should use a strategy like Morse algorithm, which will minimize the number of tardy jobs. And then the injury for patient number two is assumed to be the most critical and should have priority before the others. Now we have precedence. Uh, and also we have two uh, injuries, which is not uh, well considered to be moderate. Then we have precedence constraints, which can be shown like this. Job number two should be first. Job number one and six should be last. And job number three, four, and five should be in between there. And then we have Lawler's algorithm, which is the algorithm suggested to use when you have uh, precedence uh, constraints. And uh, we might remember that this algorithm will start by scheduling the, finding the last job in the schedule, and then the second last, and so on. So here, total processing time is given to be 130. This is the time to complete all these six jobs. And for the last job, we have two candidates, either number one and number six. And we can look at the tardiness for each of them. Well, job number one had a due time of 120. Job number six had a due time of 90. So if this job is placed at last in the sequence, this job number one will have least delay. So we should choose that, that one, uh, which means that job number one at the end of the sequence, then we should update the uh, the total, uh, the make span of the remaining job. So we have 115 minutes left. Now we have only one candidate left, number six, because number six should be processed after both number three, four, and five. So then it's quite easy. We should schedule job number six before number one. Now we have to update the make span of the remaining jobs, and now we have three possibilities, three, four, and five. We should choose the one, which here is number four, 
which has the smallest tardiness. This one will not be delayed at all, so it should be positioned in, uh, placed in, in the current position. Then update again. We have two candidates left, number three and five. Find out which of them will have the highest or, or the, the lowest tardiness in this position, which now is job number five. And then we have job number three left. And at first, we remember that job number two has to be first in the sequence. So the sequence here will be like this. 2, 3, 5, 4, 6, and 1 with a given processing time, given completion time, and tardiness as shown here. So that was the answer for problem number 1 and 2. We'll take a break and then we will continue with problem number 3 uh, after uh, 15 minutes.